Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Still good. That's been a great summit. This is my third one. And uh, if you've been to any of my previous talks, you know there's typically a theme. It's sort of uh, taking what Spark already does and finding a way to make some part of it 10x better, be it on data engineering or data science, be it in cost, ease of use, reliability, performance. And today's going to be no different. We're going to talk about really interesting things, something which I care about, which is really how to make data production 10 times easier, whether that refers to analytic type queries or operational queries or machine learning oriented queries. I'm the founder and CTO of Swoop. We are an advertising company, and I hasten to say we have absolutely nothing to do with the annoying ads that chase you around the internet. In fact, we hate them just as much as you do. But fundamentally, as an advertising business, we create a marketplace. And the marketplace is effectively run by petabyte scale machine learning and data engineering. If uh, Spark jobs don't work correctly, we will fail our financial audit because we bill our clients based on the output of Spark processes. So we really, really care about using Spark well, using Spark efficiently, um, and evolving the organization well in our entire sort of data engineering, data science platform. We've built a, what I call a data-powered culture. That means three things for us. It means that everybody's empowered to ask questions. Most questions are fairly quick, cheap, and easy to answer. And collaboration within teams, across teams, and even outside of our company with customers and partners around data is very easy. And all this happens flexibly. There is no you know, committee that determines data formats and so on and so forth. Ultimately, building a data power card is about the ability to answer questions and answer questions quickly. And today, the topic is how to answer questions much, much more quickly and easily using goal-based data production. This is a typical data production request in the advertising space. You can call it an ad hoc analytic query. I just picked one example, but everything we're going to discuss applies equally well to operational data production requests or to machine learning oriented data production requests. So give me the top 10 campaigns running on health sites by gross revenue for the past two complete weeks by week typically because our clients like to get weekly reports. And I also want to see cost per click, which is defined as gross revenue divided by number of times somebody clicked on an ad. And I also want to see the click-through rate, which is the number of clicks divided by the number of views of ads. Pretty straightforward. This is the Spark SQL to compute this in our environment. That is not straightforward. It's not overly complicated, but it's definitely not simple. There's two joins. One to figure out the site vertical in order to restrict to health sites. Another one to bring in the campaign name by campaign ID. This is not meant to be read. Please don't attempt. I haven't tried. Actually, uh, this is the result. Mm. I reordered slides. So this is basically what we want to see, what we said before. This is the Spark SQL that we talked about. It is, again, reasonably large-ish. And there's some fairly nasty-looking kind of expressions just go on and on and on and on um, here, which have to do with dealing with complete weeks, which is something that a standard API doesn't handle, standard SQL doesn't handle. If you ever used a tool like Looker, you would see that it generates SQL, which is even scarier than this. This is actually a fairly simplified form that uh, one of the Databricks engineers helped me figure out how to do, because I simply couldn't fit the normal way of doing this on a single slide and make the code remotely readable. The DSL version of the code is effectively equivalent. It's not much simpler. And the reason is that the abstraction of Spark SQL and of any of the DSLs, R, Python, Scala, Java, is essentially the same. So you're not gaining, I mean, you can get some benefits of using one versus the other, but they're not 10x benefits. The reason for all this code is because Spark needs to know two things. It needs to know not just what you want the results to be, but how it should produce them. And the reason for that is that Spark is a general purpose data processing engine. This is Spark's greatest strength, but it's also Spark's greatest weakness. As a general data processing engine, it can't make any assumptions about our data. 
but our data doesn't change that frequently. Your data doesn't change that frequently because your business doesn't change that frequently. Yes, it changes over time, but next week you're not going to be in a different business than you are this week, most likely. Well, there are lots of problems with generality, right? First problem is verbosity. Here I took the DSL code and I colored every single character having to do with what I wanted the result to be, blue, and then I colored every single character related to how I wanted the result to be computed, red. And it turns out that about 95% of the characters in the code relate to how to produce the result. It's basically plumbing. The entire result is completely well defined just by the blue. The rest is me telling Spark how to make it happen. I encourage you to look at your own code and how you use Spark, and you'll likely find kind of a 10x imbalance between the what and the how. There's a further problem. Across different queries, you end up with a lot of duplication. And the top, you see how we compute the click-through rate with some basic, you know, divide by zero checking, and turning it to a percentage, and formatting it for human consumption with only uh, three digits of precision as percentage click-through rate, right? This will never change. Every time a human wants to see a click-through rate, we should do this. Why do we have to type it every single time into Spark? This snippet is probably repeated dozens of times in various older Spark notebooks and code. Second chunk of code is joining the campaign ID on, um, sorry, joining uh, the campaign stable on campaign ID in order to get a campaign name, right? That will also forever be the case. In our data model, because we're dealing with so much data, we don't store large strings in the raw data. We store integer IDs. And so if you want to get a human form of that, then you need to do a join. Another problem with generality is complexity. This is what it takes to compute the beginning of the week using a mundane-based week uh, with the result being in the eastern east coast sort of business time zone if your timestamp column is a Unix epoch timestamp in seconds. Of course, you also have the problem with inflexibility because this expression is bound to the start of the week, the time zone, the specific column name, and the data type and units in the column. So if you're a consulting company who wants to do something like handle beginning of week queries, which are very common in business, with other clients, you have to keep tweaking this. You can't even write an easy UDF which just says beginning of week, because beginning of week based on what input, with what time zone. So you can write the UDF which is beginning of week with a bunch of other parameters, or beginning of week for Unix timestamps with a bunch of parameters, right? You see the problem. So it begs the question, can we do data production by focusing just on what we want the results to be and kind of ignoring the how? Because keep in mind, the how here is completely defined by the what. There's absolutely no new and unknown information there. An equivalent question is whether we can make the how rather than explicit in code we write, whether we can make it implicit context what joints we do, various pieces of configuration, and so on and so forth. Anything which stays the same or changes very, very infrequently. And the answer is yes, we can, if we do goal-based data production. Goal-based data production starts with the end goal. What do you want the result to be? And you can see here that this particular DSL reads almost like English. There's absolutely nothing in here related to how the data is computed. It's not even a source table, which begs the question how you actually get a result. Well, let's see. So I think that's about decent zoom level. Here's my data production request. I'm using a lazy value simply to minimize the amount of output generated here. That's a nice little trick if you're using notebooks. And let me display the results. There they are. And so somehow, magically, we're getting the data that we wanted to see. We have the timestamp and the rank, and they're ordered the right way. 
the columns also seem strangely ordered. The rank is before the campaign, the gross revenue is after the campaign, CPC a percent CTR are humanized, etc. So how did this happen? Well, we can go behind the curtain, and this is not a GA-ready system, so details might, might change. A data production request has an associated set of data production goals and data production rules. An example goal is that we need to produce a column called CPC in the result set. We don't know anything more about this from the production request. We simply know that we cannot satisfy the production request until somehow we learn how to produce a column called CPC. A data production rule is that we need to filter to the past two complete weeks. From that rule, we know that we have a requirement that the source data must have a column, which is a time dimension. We don't know the source table, we don't know the column name, but we clearly cannot satisfy the data production request if we don't have a table which has such a column, right? Further, because we are filtering to two complete weeks, we have to know three additional things. We need to know the time zone of time values in the database. We need to know the time zone we want the final result in, and we need to know the start of the week. To satisfy the requirements of data production rules, we need to provide context. The more context we provide, we can start rewriting the data production rules, replacing unknowns with facts, like replace the unknown of what day of the week are we starting with the fact that we, day of the week starts on Monday. When we are fully resolved, we can actually build a data set transformation. When we align the data set transformations in the right order and associate them with tables that satisfy the requirements, we have ourselves a data set. And this is how we computed the results. Spark makes this quite easy because the underlying data structures in Spark are actually introspectable. Columns are just expressions plus metadata and a few other little bits that we don't have to worry about, and the transformations are essentially plans. In fact, the rewriting of production rules I just talked about is very much how Spark rewrites logical plans to turn them into optimized physical plans. In fact, we can see some of this if we go back and ask the data production request to tell us about its result plan. Now here you see the production rule chain. I want to focus just on one piece here, which is one optimization. Remember that we ask, to, um, we ask for top campaign. So normally this would involve grouping by campaign, but somehow we're grouping by campaign ID and only then joining campaigns by campaign ID to get the campaign name. Typical BI system will actually do the join before the group by. And then it's going to group by by the campaign name, which is a string. That's actually quite inefficient. First, you're doing a join on all the source data. Second, you're joining by string, which is much more expensive. You're grouping by string as opposed to an int, which is much more expensive. In this case, we actually had an optimization hint, which I'll show you later which allowed the system to rewrite the production and move the join to after the group by. So goal-based data production doesn't just make things more easy and more flexible, it also makes them faster and cheaper. And that's a really, really big deal. So at all this talk about context, some of you may be getting this kind of foreboding feeling of the amount of pain and suffering involved in providing all this metadata. In fact, some of you may be involved in enterprise efforts to build sort of like the one true unified metadata view of the enterprise. I'm sure you want to relive this again. It was so pleasant and wonderful experience. The meetings were short. Everybody agreed on things. Right, so no. This is the old way of doing things, and it's really the reason why so many traditional ETL and BI tools cost millions of dollars and take years to deploy. In a smart data warehouse, you actually want to think of your metadata 
as a queryable pool. And the context for executing a data production request is basically a query on the pool of metadata. So you can combine stable, blessed metadata, like you know, the 3.1.2 production release, with uh, up-to-the-moment metadata, like uh, Sims machine learning experiments. You could even try to execute a production request and get an error saying, hey, look, I cannot execute this production request because I don't know how to do X. You're asking for a column, and I don't know how to produce it. And you can, at this very moment, actually code a rule and persist it into the pool. So metadata can be provided just in time in little bits and pieces. It also can be generative. Rather than providing detailed, meticulous information about every single field of every single table, many of which we may never use, you could use generative rules. This is a rule which says that any table which has a campaign ID column can be joined against the campaigns table. But sometimes columns with the same name don't have the same data. So you could actually have a rule which is based on the contents of the column. It basically says, hey, I don't care what the name is. As long as it contains swoop campaign IDs, then we're good. And in fact, the raw data, swoop campaign IDs exist under at least three different names. One is uh, data.placement.campaignID in camel case. Another one is campaign underscore ID at the top level. And the third one, um, well, actually, there's more than three. Right? But they're all swoop campaign IDs, since so the system can automatically join based on, that, based on that knowledge. Calculated columns can be automatically made available to any table that satisfies their requirements. In this case, a click-through rate column can be made available to any table which has a, or not table, any data set, right? Produced, doesn't have to be source data, that has clicks and views. Humanization can change the name of columns. This is how we got the row and column ordering, in that when you're executing a rank, when you're doing a rank of something, humans typically want to see the rank column before the something and they want to see the buy columns in order after the something. So that's how we ended up with rank, campaign, gross revenue in the output table. It's not magic, it's just common sense. Remember how we talked about this group buy and join optimization, doing the join after the group buy? This is the piece of metadata which allows us to um, do this right there the primary key relationship between campaign and campaign ID is one-to-one. -one. Key point here is that Spark's own optimizer can never, ever, ever perform this optimization because that's a data-aware optimization. And a general system can never perform data-aware optimizations because it can never assume that your data satisfies this constraint. Right? And that's a very big point. When we start providing data-aware metadata, Smart systems can do really, really wonderful things for us. Why did we pick the particular table to execute the query on? In Swoop, in fact, there are at least 14 tables that I know of, off the top of my head, that could satisfy this data production request. You could go all the way from raw data to a number of pre-built aggregates. The difference is between getting the answer in under 10 seconds and getting the answer in you know, 10 plus hours on a small cluster. So imagine a system that can automatically pick source data and joins based on cost. Imagine a query which used to run slowly, but then somebody decided to persist a certain piece of data production, and without you changing a line of code, without even knowing that this has happened, suddenly it starts running 100 times faster. Imagine a system which watches the data production request being sent and executed that actually automatically decides to introduce caching or persistence at some level in order to improve performance. It's really, really powerful. And by now, I hopefully have convinced you that goal-based data production can literally make data production about 10 times easier. And the best part is it interoperates beautifully with everything else you're doing in Spark because it produces just standard data sets and data frames and can use standard Spark expressions, UDFs, you name it. To me, the benefits are really revolutionary because when we drop down the volume of code and when we focus on the what as opposed to the how, we gain not only 
more flexibility, possibility of performance. We also reduce bugs. We reduce technical debt. We reduce management complexity. We make collaboration easier because data production requests are abstract and can be shared without specific binding. Imagine a consulting company which builds vertical data packs for different industries, combining pre-built analytics, operational machine learning queries with bits and pieces of metadata. And they only have to adapt small amounts of metadata to sort of provide, uh, eliminate the impotence mismatch between the company's data and their view of things. Imagine somebody open sourcing that and actually boosting the productivity of all Spark users within a given industry. Collaboration really becomes very, very powerful in this environment across teams, across companies. And to me, it's really important that you can actually get business users to ask and answer their own questions without sending emails to the data engineering team. In fact, the head of marketing at Swoop is doing fairly sophisticated data analytics in a Scala Databricks notebook. I helped him set it up. I helped him design some abstractions to make his life easier, but it's been months since he last asked me anything about that. And he's doing very complicated ad hoc data processing. It's really quite powerful. So I want to leave you today with two calls to action. The first one is simple. Take a look at the code in your organization, especially code living in notebooks, and kind of ask yourself, are you seeing the same amount of verbosity and duplication? Are you seeing the repeated, hey, Spark, here's how you do what I wanted you to do over and over and over again? And second, if you do, then join me and help create the best free and open source goal-based data production system. Thank you. I'd love to answer some questions, and if you have some feedback, please stop by. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand for the microphone. Oh, just Steven, since it's the last session, just come on over and we'll chat. Thank you.